how did you how did you proceed to write this impressive and long time and worldwide study and how did you re so how did you realize your project um i once i realized uh, firstly the, the first step was was understanding that this was a topic that needed to be explored further and and the way i came to understand that was um by 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 noticing how dramatically the conversation was changing globally around uh, sexual orientation and gender identity not just in my own country where i was now able to get married as a gay man um But, but in other places too and and i was i was very struck by the way um some in some parts of the world like in south africa um there was huge progress being made uh, around um equality when it comes to sexual orientation and gender uh, identity and expression but in other parts of the world there was the opposite that um now that these discussions were being had um an issue that had previously been unspoken was now in public and there were clampdowns and backlashes and even um new laws that that um that criminalized homosexuality in particular even further and i wanted to understand this i wanted to understand why and how this was happening mm -hmm. and what the impact of this was and and i came upon this concept that there was a, a a new pink line as a human rights frontier a new human rights frontier describing and defining but also dividing the world in a in a whole new way and that there was that there was a new geopolitics to this um that this was being used geopolitically um uh by 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 leaders uh and and politicians and and religious leaders all over the world as a, as a new way of defining us and them but what exactly um, do you mean by the pink line uh, there are several ones in your book a lot of pink lines hmm. how would you how, how would you describe the conception of a pink line well well i suppose on on a as i was saying on a, on a geopolitical level the pink line is a human rights frontier and on one side of this human rights frontier are those countries or people who have extended a, a, an analysis of what universal human rights means to lgbtq people um through anti discrimination laws through marriage equality laws um through those through those sorts of of processes and and in the process norms have changed too on the other side of that pink line geopolitically are are, are countries or, or or politicians who see this who define this as as one of the ways that that the west that a secular west is unfairly and imperialistically trying to influence um the world and 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 threaten the cultural sovereignty or traditional values of their country so so people who are on that side of the pink line who articulated most clearly are politicians like Vladimir Putin or Viktor Orban or 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 the Kaczynski brothers in in Poland or or African leaders who 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 speak about homosexuality as a as a western imposition mm -hmm. on their culture so so that that's the, that's the geopolitical way i define the pink line mm -hmm. um but but the pink line becomes through the process of my book um something that that runs not only through countries but between uh, not only between countries but through countries and and i see how this happens uh, very strongly in my own country south africa the way we have um you know such progressive laws on the books but on the ground there is still very violent um uh discrimination against people who are gender nonconforming mm -hmm. um because social norms haven't changed and because in fact um on the ground there's been backlash to the fact that a younger generation of queer people have claimed space that they didn't have before mm -hmm. there's backlash from from a sort of 
from from patriarchal elements on on the ground to, for example, young butch lesbians publicly being out and about with their girlfriends. This is seen as threatening to men. And and these lesbians are are accused of taking the jobs of men as well. So even within a country, you can see how the pink line functions. I, I, I write too how in this, one of the things I'm particularly interested in is is why this conversation has happened so dramatically and so quickly in just a generation, why the changes happen. And the answer is, of course, um, globalization mm -hmm. and most powerfully the digital revolution. So one of the things I write about is the pink line that exists between the kind of online freedom or community you can have if you have a cell phone and, and some broadband and a little bit of data, but the, the offline strictures that you have to face when you look up from your cell phone into the eyes of a parent who says that you are doing something wrong or a church that says you are a demon or a state that says that you are a criminal. So the pink line is, is one that runs between online and offline as well, between that kind of digital global space where even though there are risks that I look at in the book, new security risks, where you can you can be yourself, but then the, the, the strictures of offline life. So th those are the different ways the pink line lives. Now, you asked how I went about realizing this project. I think this is very important, which is, is that once I had this um, conceptual structure in place, it was very important for me to understand how people live on the pink line, what life is like for queer people having to deal with these, these new global political dynamics. And that's really how I went about realizing this book is, is that with a, with a fellowship from the Open Society Foundation, I traveled expensively, ex ex expensively and extensively. Mm -hmm. um, I would not have been able to do it without George Soros. And, and how did you... Um, how did you um, identify the protagonists of your book? How did you, uh, what criteria did you have where to go to what countries or well, regions? It was, sometimes it was quite random. It was just where I knew people or where Open Society Foundation had an office who could host me. But it, was, it, was, it wasn't just random. I, I, I specifically, I consulted very widely about which countries seemed to be pink line frontiers. And, 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 and I was very broad in what I understood to be a pink line frontier. So Russia is a pink line frontier, obviously because of the, the uh, official homophobia there and the Anti-Gay Propaganda Act. Um, but I saw the United States as a pink line frontier too, because I was fascinated in the way <laughs> that the pink line was shifting from the L and the G and the B over to the T and how transgender rights were becoming a pink line in the United States. Um, I saw, I, I came to understand um, Israel and Palestine as a pink line because of the way in that country, the pink line was being drawn over the green line. You know, the green line being the line that divides the occupied territories from 1948 Israel. And the way on either side of the pink line, um, the issue of gay rights was being politicized. And, and Israel, of course, is, is accused of pinkwashing its human rights record um, against Palestinians by being a very pro-gay rights. And I look at what, so that's the, that's the conceptual idea. And I, and I went, if I can just stick with that example, I went to Israel and, and Palestine with that conceptual idea. And the first people I met were activists. Mm -hmm. who helped me understand that conceptual idea. And then I looked for a protagonist or a group of protagonists who would best exemplify that idea because I wanted to show and not tell. I wanted to be able to really understand these politics uh, from the perspective of a person living them rather than just, you know, pronounce on them from up high. And my reason for wanting to do that is because I, I, you know, so much of these pink line politics instrumentalize queer people, tell queer people who they are and who they represent. And, and I think that these politics deny queer people their agency. 
So it was an absolutely both an ethical and a narrative prerogative of mine to, to accept and acknowledge the agency of people on the ground. And this means telling their stories. So I would go to a country and meet the activists first, whether it was Russia or the United States or, or Israel or, or India or Uganda or any of the other places I worked. And then from the activists, I would figure out what the issues were. And then usually I would ask the activists to introduce me to people who I thought best exemplified those issues. So if you like, I can give another example of that. In Russia, I am... Um, I decided that the issue that, that the, the, the pink line was really parenting. And the reason why I decided that was is because if it's illegal to promote homosexuality to minors, then in rainbow families, gay parents or transgender parents are breaking the law just by being parents. Mm. And so I interviewed a whole lot of, in fact, lesbian parents about what the effect of this was on their lives. And many of these families actually left, they left Russia to other parts of the world. And I came across as I was doing this work, the, uh, the, the story of a, introduced to, to somebody by an activist who was, who was suing the, in the Russian courts to custody, for custody to her child, because she denied, she'd been denied custody because she was transgender. Mm -hmm. And I followed that case. It's the case of a woman called Pasha Kaptanovska. And I, and I tell the Russian story by telling Pasha's story. Mm -hmm. And that, a, a version of that happened in every country where I work. And let us speak now about worldwide LGBTI activism and the influence on the ground in different, let's say, remote regions such as southern India or Malawi, for example. It's often believed, particularly by the other side, that um, there is an agenda of a sort of global LGBT movement to, to go all over the world and, and, and recruit or convert new members. But, but, but really what I saw was the opposite in, in my research, which is, is, that, that, um, is, is that people curious, hungry, engaged people all over the world, once they have access to the world through digital technology, through um, the entertainment industry, through communications, um, find and download and indigenize the ideas of, of a global movement to their own reality as part of their own um, mission to find um, freer or more fulfilled or more authentic lives. So for me, the, um, a powerful example of this is what I saw in South India, India where I, 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 I wrote about, where I, I, I met and researched and wrote about a community of people called Kotis. And Kotis um, define themselves as women's hearts in men's bodies. And, and what I find really interesting about Kotis is, is that they are, the Kotis who I met is that they were striving using the ideas that they were learning from a, a global human rights movement that was actually diffused into their community through AIDS activism, interestingly. The power of AIDS activism in, in spreading these, um, these, these, these ideas is, is very powerful. Because, uh, because of the way um, uh, public health has come to understand that you cannot reach people who are underground and that if you're going to try and stop the spread of the epidemic, you have to reach um, what, what epidemiologists call men who, who have sex with men. And this means creating space for them to be open and, 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 and to talk about their identities. Anyway, so the Kotis, who I met were very interestingly trying to find a destiny for themselves outside of um, the destiny prescribed for them. The destiny that said either they were to totally suppress their gender identities and their, and their desires and get married to women and just live a straight life. That's the one option. 
Or the other option is to become hijras, which I, I have always been in, in, in Indian society, uh, third gender people who, who literally leave mainstream society because they are chased out or because they flee and form this alternative um, uh, society uh, where they earn living through sex work and um, begging. It's quite a brutal society. It's very feudal. Uh, and it includes a, a ritual castration that you sort of have to go through whether you want to or not. Now, the Cortes I met didn't want either of those options. They wanted to be who they were, women's hearts and men's bodies. They didn't want to wear saris all the time. They didn't necessarily want to lose their genitals. They wanted to most importantly stay in their home communities. They didn't want to have to leave their home communities. So they were articulating a desire for personal autonomy that comes from, let's be honest, Western notions of, um, of, of individual freedom. But they were articulating them in their home village uh, through a devotion to a particular deity uh, called Angalaman, who requires you to wear a sari when you are praying to her. And, and, and therefore, effeminate men are seen, as to, seen to be closer to the divine if they provide access to this deity. Mm -hmm. And it was in this really, I thought, creative and profound way, and not, not unique. It's not, I just happened to find this one story, but there are many, many, many communities like this, I understand. Um, it was fascinating to see to me how um, this community of Kotis were indigenizing um, a, a global notion of, of human rights and personal autonomy and, and living your true life, all these global ideas. And then later I watched because I followed the Kotis for, for, for a decade nearly in this community. I watched as how uh, an understanding of transgender rights came to India. Now transgender rights is a is the Western notion in its, in its derivation. Let's not, there have always been gender fluid people in, in societies all over the world, and particularly in India and in South India. But this idea that you are, that as a transgender person, you have a certain number of human rights. Um, uh, uh, and also this idea that you can change your body medically uh, come from Western society. Mm -hmm. And by looking at the at the Cortes, I track um, the effect of of these ideas um, on uh, on third gender, on Corti people, on Hydra people in India, and it's fascinating. And and in that way, India too is a, is a is a pink line frontier. And similarly, the Philippines, another another country I write about, um, not a, not in as great length, but but very similar dynamics there that I found fascinating. Looking at the legal and social situation around the world of LGBTI people worldwide, are you rather optimistic or pessimistic? You know, I, I find it very difficult to be either. But what I will say is, is that I think it's really important to note, as I do in the book, um, that it is not so simple to say, as Martin Luther King famously did, um, the arc of history bends towards justice when it comes to these rights. Because of the way these rights challenge um, very deeply rooted patriarchal social norms and religious dogmas. And for that reason, uh, rather than an arc bending towards justice, I see a pendulum because there's action and then there's backlash. Nonetheless, um, I, do, I do think there's reason to be optimistic in the way that even if it causes um, violent backlash, visibility um, inevitably brings about an increase of tolerance and acceptance, inevitably. Because once people begin to see that this evil demon is actually someone they know or love or respect, a certain number of them, not all, 
are going to get rid of the idea of it as an even de evil demon. And you see that happening. You really do see that happening. So that's on a micro level. And, and I feel I did see that happening in so many places. On, on a more macro level, um, an increasing number of countries are decriminalizing homosexuality. Slow, slow, but it's happening. I mean, in my part of the world, most recently, Mozambique and, um, and Angola, two very large countries, have, have decriminalized homosexuality for interesting reasons you know, for pragmatic reasons, I think, um, which is interesting. Um, you also see an increasing number of countries moving towards marriage equality, particularly in East Asia, uh, which, uh, which, is, which is very, very interesting. So it's, not, it's becoming more and more difficult. In fact, I think it's impossible to think of a pink line dividing the West and the rest. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it, it, that's just, it's not hard work. If you look at, if you look at the map, um, you'll see increasingly parts of the world that, that are not in the West um, changing in such interesting ways. Um, and then in parts of the world that have been now considered to be the West, such as Hungary, you see that, and, and Poland, I mean, even though they're, they're on a frontier, they, they're part of the European Union, you see some, some serious backtracking in terms of the, in terms of the law and the leadership. Now, whether that backtracking is, is shared by the population is an interesting question that I think um, we're going to see the answer of in, in, in times to come. It was fascinating for me to track the Polish election mm -hmm. and to see that even though um, the, the Law and Justice Party made such a big thing about LGBT ideology, it really was one of their, their main planks, um, the opposition candidate, Trzaskowski, who was, who was branded as being, you know, pink because he had um, signed an LGBT plus charter as, as mayor of, of Warsaw. He, he really just lost the election by a tiny margin, mm. which means that for a majority, for, 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 for almost half of Polish voters, mm. um, LGBT ideology was a, a non-issue for almost half of them, or not a big enough issue for them to go to the other camp. And I think that there's a lesson there and a lesson there for Viktor Orban too. Um, he is going to find that if he wants to leave Europe because um, Europe is telling him that he cannot discriminate against queer people, he's going to lose a lot of support among ordinary Hungarians.